I said, the first two we're going to work on are the Department of Revenue and the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Why? Because every citizen almost encounters those agencies. And I said, if we could ever fix those, people might trust us when we bring them the next big idea. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, you, you know, your tombstone's going to say he had four beautiful daughters and fixed the BMV. And I said, well, that'd be okay. <laughs> I spent a lot of time around our students. They come in every description, uh, and we got a few knuckleheads, but overwhelmingly they want to do good things. They want to be part of a, a safer, a, a cleaner planet. They want to uh, do things for people who are disadvantaged or who are ill. And I was really convinced all along that we could rally them, and you should see our campus. Welcome to Straight Talk a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute. Today I'm speaking with Mitch Daniels. Mitch is the president of Purdue University. He served as the governor of Indiana from 2005 to 2013 and previously served as chief of staff to Senator Richard Lugar, senior advisor to President Ronald Reagan, and Director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush. He also held a number of top posts at Eli Lilly, including President of their North American Pharmaceutical Operations. He is the author of three books and a contributing columnist in the Washington Post. Mitch, welcome to the podcast. Like many others who know you well, I've always hoped you would be president of the United States. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Let's start with your early life. In high school, you were student body president. Where did this disposition for leadership come from? I really don't know. My folks were not political, they were good citizens, and uh, but that's all. But at somewhere back then, I guess I found it a natural ambition to try to be uh, in a position of responsibility. And when I sought those opportunities, they happened. And I guess one led to the next. But I will say that I was never consumed with the desire to hold elected public office. I admired those who did. And I, I served a few that I admired, especially. But uh, I don't know. It was an interest from an early age, but it, uh, it's not something that I was uh, forced on me. And we all benefited from it, but so you weren't initially inspired to pursue public uh, office. So how did you get interested in public policy and government service? The most important thing that happened to me was uh, that I was offered a chance at $50 a week to work as the lowest on the totem pole of a little primitive Senate campaign. Literally a, a guy whose grass I cut to make a little extra money suspected that I might have an interest. He said, listen, I know some people that's campaigning this guy named Bill Ruckelshaus. Bill Ruckelshaus was a great oh, yeah. who made a great president and who we lost last year. But so that sounded better than building tennis courts and cutting grass, which is what I was doing my uh, first uh, summer after entering college. So I went to work for Bill. Uh, he didn't make it, but he was a kindred spirit of Richard Luger who was the then boy wonder, brand new mayor who eventually turned around a city and then went on to become a great international statesman. And that was really what happened to me. I was drawn into his orbit, worked for him for the next more than a decade. I always said it was like being in graduate school every day without paying tuition. And he was a, like Ruckel's house, Sam Dick Luger was to me a, a iconic, a, the epitome of what we want in public life. And uh, so uh, working for him planted those seeds pretty deeply. Well, I tell you, that brings me back to the past because I was just a kid in the Nixon White House. And in those days, you know, Ruckel's house, of course, was the star of the, the, the EPA and Lugar. He was just incredible. And he was just terrific on the Foreign Policy Committee. I mean, he was an amazing senator. And those, those two men were born four months and seven blocks apart <laughs> at a memorial service for, I guess it was the virtual one we did for Ruck. You know, I, I posed the question, you know, what was in the water <laughs> on the west side of Indianapolis in 1932 that gave us two people like that uh, almost simultaneously? And you were in the same neighborhood. And you, I believe, as much as anybody I know, set the gold standard 
the for governor, you know, in terms of what you accomplished during your tenure as governor of Indiana, you know, going from that big deficit to its first triple A credit rating, leading the nation in infrastructure building. I, I still remember when you, some of the things you did in the, the highway and some of the innovative financing, sweeping education, healthcare reforms. It became one of the country's very best uh, states for attracting business. So what was the key, your ability to get things done as governor? How did you approach this? Mm -hmm. I was asked frequently then, I'm asking the job I have now, uh, people will inquire, uh, well, you've had a chance to have a variety of different jobs. Uh, which ones helped prepare you the best? And they always think I'm going to mention something from public life because that was so much more visible. You know, I always think they're going to, I'm going to say something about working for one of the two presidents I served or, or working in the Senate with Luger or something. And that's not the answer. The answer is in the years I spent in private life in business, which was the longest stretch I spent anywhere. And those were the lessons I drew on the most, Hank. Things like the importance of having very clear direction that's well understood by a large and complex organization. And then building structures where people are both highly motivated, but also accountable for delivering you know, whatever they're gonna do that's gonna to contribute to that result. And so I uh, remember that after election, I convened a meeting of the, oh, probably the first 80 or 100 people who agreed to be part of our administration. Almost all were gonna be new to government or at least state government. And I said to them, I said, look, any great endeavor, any business or other enterprise that I ever observed had a very clear purpose and everybody understood what it was. It was on the wall or it was on the annual report if they had one, it was uh, on the laminated ID card. It was the pick your buzzword mission, vision, or something. but everybody understood what the goal was. And then everyone understood what their role was in delivering that goal and the place had its act together. There were really good systems for figuring out if that was happening. and If not, why not? I said, okay, here's ours. We're here to raise the disposable income of Hoosiers. We're going to do everything we can do to rebuild a state that is really attractive to people of enterprise to either uh, come here or, or start something here. And we're going to be looking for jobs that pay on average, more than the ones we have today. Then we're going to run the people's business in a way that leaves more of those dollars in the pockets of those who earn them. And if we do that, government will have the revenue it needs to do the things it must do. And people will have the wherewithal to pursue their own individual dreams and ambitions. I said, that's it. If we do that, everything else becomes easy. And I said, I don't care where you're working, you'll have a role to play in delivering that. And we're going to figure out what that is. We're going to measure it and so forth. That's what ultimately worked. And I'll just say one other thing. When I started, I had not intended to run for public office, but people came to me and said, look, the state's sinking and we got to turn it around. Somebody's got to do something. And for the first month or so, and again, I'm a no-name first-time candidate, embarking on a year and a half going to the, even the smallest corners of the state over and over and over to try to demonstrate that everybody matters and every place has to be part of this comeback. And um, for the first month or two, I had a very irresponsible outlook. I said to the group, I said, listen, we're going to keep this simple, stupid. The state's broke. Government is broken. We're sinking economically. Uh, 16 years, it's time for a change, QED. That's it. And I wasn't out there very long before I realized that is, one, not a responsible way to ask for public office. And two, it would not lead to the result that the only reason you should seek it in the first place, make something different, make something better. And so we began building an agenda that eventually comprised over 70 very specific items. We told people exactly what we were gonna do. They were big goals in many cases. And then we had to as people like to say, sort of the mandate or the authority to go do that. And um, I think even those who disagreed with things we did would concur that they were eight extraordinarily eventful, active, and important years for Indiana. Sorry for a long answer. No, that was, that was great. You said something that really resonated with me because early in my career, I worked in the Pentagon and worked in the White House. Then I had this 32 years at Goldman Sachs before being Treasury Secretary. And people often want to point to my early years. And maybe that inspired me to go back, but it was what I learned at Goldman Sachs that made it easier for me to get things done because the same things you pointed to plus i think what you learn in the private sector 
is how to motivate people and how to work with people and how to listen because you really, you don't get any deal done. You don't get anything accomplished unless you can listen to people, find middle ground, work with them and so on. And the, the thing that's unique about the United States of America is that people in the United States can move from business to government and to government jobs in Washington and the state and back and forth. And some people attack that. And I think that is something that is really benefits our country. I really agree with that. Oh, it has, it has, uh, uh, you know, there are aspects of it that you're not really talking about. I mean, you know, that's why we need revolving door laws and things. So people don't simply trade on their influence, but you know, I've counseled so many young people who come and say, oh, I'm, I'm on fire to take part in the government and politics. I encourage that. But I say, I really encourage you to build some, spend some time, build some credibility in the productive sector of society. You'll learn things that will really help you. And, and you'll have a sense later, if you do hold office of public responsibility, you will have a greater empathy for the, and a greater understanding of how what you're doing may be affecting the people you serve. Yeah, and thank you for clarifying, because I also feel very strongly about that. I mean, neither you nor I became lobbyists, you know. I left government and I went and I didn't do anything in government for 32 years. And then after working on the bank rescues, there's no way I was going to go back and work for a bank. So I, I went to not profit, not for profit. But there is a great benefit to having business experience. Now, I want to talk about You've had experiences at the federal government level and at the state level. You know, so talk about the differences there. You don't have a printing press. You know, another of the great lessons that you and I learned in business is how to make ends meet, which ultimately uh, resolves to making decisions about priorities and making choices and saying a yes to those that you believe have, will have the most positive net positive effect and, and no or not now to others. And uh, you cannot escape that in most of life. Families operate that way and, uh, and businesses have to operate that way to survive. And in the main, although there are some exceptions, <laughs> responsible governments, state and local have to do it. There's one exception which is that you and I have experienced firsthand in the last few months are astonishing to me in which the people have, uh, with the justification of the extraordinary circumstances, decided that there is simply no limit to the amount of uh, essentially monopoly money that we can create and, and hope that it won't have terrible consequences later on. I remember when I got elected early on in the term, I said in some speech somewhere, I said, you know, the first thing I did when I got in that beautiful office they have for the governor here is I, I looked in all the closets to see if there was a printing press and there's not. And that means that, you know, if we're gonna deal with this big debt we've got, deficit and debt in the state, we're gonna have to, you know, do some things we'd rather not do. But that's the fundamental difference. I, I guess I'd point to one other. I spent better part of three very fascinating and gratifying years at the Office of Management and Budget. And we, we used to say at the time that uh, it's time to put the M in OMB. It's always the forgotten assignment. And uh, we did our best. We rated every program in the federal government. It, it, it extended beyond my term because there's so many that it took five years on a schedule, but we put an effectiveness rating on every one what was its stated purpose and what could, how could we tell whether it was delivering or not? Now, if they had brought you that at Goldman, you'd have said, hey, great, thanks. And you would have looked and you would have said <laughs> to the, the failing business units or whatever they were, either show me a plan to shape up or we're going to take the resources from you and put it over here where it's working really well. Needless to say, the board of directors of the federal government, that is to say the U.S. Congress, doesn't think that way. And uh, a lot of great people did a lot of terrific work, and I am unable to identify a single case in which the Congress or one of its committees looked at those analyses and said, okay, we're going to take money away from failing a line item A and move it to successful line item X. So, yeah, well said. And you pointed out the obvious fact that the government can print money, federal government can. And I think you and I both know that it's something you can't get away with forever. It's hard to predict when, but there's some time the markets won't take it anymore. And 
and then it's going to be hard to work our way out of it and the dollar will no longer be the global reserve currency now i hope it doesn't come to that and i think the things we can do to avert that but it's that'll be a grim day if it arrives yeah um you know i didn't give you the sad punchline to the last answer but actually state and local government can be well managed and we were determined to prove that the single best example i could give you a hundred but the one that everyone will notice and it's to this day remembers in indiana is if you go to an Indiana Bureau of Motor Vehicles branch, and you probably don't have to go because we moved almost everything to the internet even 15 years ago and the, and the mail. But if you have to go, you will be met at the door by a greeter and welcomed. You'll be directed to the line that will help you. You'll be out in 10 or 12 minutes. We always knew to the second on a monthly basis. And uh, on, on the receipt, when you pay for your commercial driver's license, whatever it is, it will tell you how many minutes you were there. I live in Illinois, you're making me cry. Don't rub it in. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, this was a huge matter with me, Hank. There's no excuse for government being poorly managed. I used to say over and over, we can have big arguments about what the proper sphere and size of government should be and what it should do and what it should not do. But regardless how big or small you think that sphere should be, you should want the place to work well. If you're a big government advocate, then you should be incensed if government wastes money and doesn't deliver on its uh, intended purposes for people. If, you're a, if you believe in more limited government, then you ought to be really determined that each dollar be well spent. But instead, people get elected and they don't get rewarded for that. So when we got there, I said to people, everything matters. We're going to measure everything. You know, I used to quote my Walmart friends, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. You know, we're going to move at the speed of business, not the speed of government. People who worked with us then still can remind me how I these little slogans. But um, but anyway, uh, I said the first two we're going to work on are the Department of Revenue and the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. I mean, not the first two, but the two we're really going to jump on the hardest. Why? Because every citizen almost encounters those agencies. And I said, if we could ever fix those, people might trust us when we bring them the next big idea and uh, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, you, you know, your tombstone's going to say he had four beautiful daughters and fixed the BMV. And I said, well, that'd be OK. <laughs> it, it sure would. So, Mitch, you did it at the state level. OMB, you know, you're president of the North American Pharmaceutical Division of Eli Lilly. And so now you go into education. So you became president of Purdue. What attracted you to university leadership? Well, I said no the first, I think it was three times that the board came tiptoeing around. Then I found myself saying, well, maybe, and then yes. And I think what it came to, Hank, was as I was entering or moving through the last year of the last job, I started asking myself, what other executive position, and, and, and I was most comfortable in a place where you are ultimately accountable person, what other executive position in the state that I want to live in and care about, in what such job could I do more good, if you did it well, for this state and maybe beyond, except the job I'm leaving? And I couldn't think of one, because Purdue University, even more now than then, is our land-grant school. It is our, so as we say these days, STEM school in, a, in a, an economy where science and technology is more and more the key to success for individuals or geographies. So I guess that, I think that was it. I decided quite appropriately under our constitution, two terms as governor is enough, but the, this is the next best place if you could figure out how to do a, a decent job of it. So I've been delighted to do that. You know, as we're recording this, I'm about... Uh, three weeks, I suppose, from I'll have been in this job as long as the last job. It's astonishing to contemplate. It's amazing. And of course, a major problem afflicting our nation. I think it's been one of the biggest problems we have. We have a lot of big problems with the skyrocketing cost of higher education. Frankly, I think it's disgraceful. But you've been a real leader at Purdue on student affordability. It's less expensive to attend Purdue today than it was in 2012. How was this achieved and what can other universities learn from your experience here? I always start by saying that we are not trying to prescribe or preach to other universities. Uh, each one is uh, happily is different and unique. And uh, so uh, what we've done, we believe is right for our university, but others have to make their own choices. As to the how, 
The shortest answer I've learned to give is we solve the equation for zero, meaning we set out asking ourselves if we would like to, again, we've done it for nine years now, hold tuition flat, hold room and board flat or better, we've actually lowered those, how else would we do that? And uh, if you make that your top priority, turns out it's, it's not impossible at all to achieve it. Now, an honest answer, my first year, so that's 2013, I said to the, to the board, or in the, a few months in, they had to make the next tuition decision. They'd raised it 36 years in a row, like probably every other school in the country had at that point. It was just routine. Only question was how much. And I said, people are getting pinched and people are beginning to question the value as these tuitions and fees keep rising. And they're right to do that. I said, I've had a little look around here. I think we could skip a year. And that's all I had in mind at the beginning. I thought that would send a signal that we understand the need for affordability and accessibility. And we're going to work on it. I had no idea that we'd be able to do a second year, then a third and just keep going. But we have. There's no magic to it, except there is a, a little bit of a self-reinforcing flywheel here. As we prioritized affordability and were able to hold down tuition and uh, become obviously more and more valuable. Quality was going up. We keep investing. We've invested, with, uh, the faculty's grown as fast as the student body. We began to attract more students. And again, we're a land grant school. We were put here to democratize education and open the doors of higher ed to more people. So in terms you'll recognize immediately, the top line got stronger. That enables a lot of things. We're about 15 or 16% more students today than we had back then. And as you know, enrollments have been going down during this decade across the rest of higher ed. Then of course we tried to economize, but uh, part of it is just building an ethic. Again, getting lots of people involved. People, I, I, I've used this little metaphor many times in, in many jobs that uh, in big organizations, you can only find so many places where you can take a cleaver and take a, off a great big piece of fat. The problem is the fat is marbled through the animal. Yep. And so you got to get everybody looking for small efficiencies to go along with that occasional big score that you can, you know, just stop something or change it fundamentally. So it sounds like what you've done is taken sort of the Mitch Daniels management principles and you've used very similar principles. You've adapted them to different organizations in education federal government, state government, and so on. But you've, you've got your basic set of, of, of management principles. I suppose that's right. You said something a little while ago that's always going to be a part, I think, of significant progress and that success and that. You used words like motivation or inspiration or something. I'll say here something I've said now to at least the last two, uh, I'll say, sets of employers, the people who wanted me to run for governor, the trustees who asked me to do this job, at some point in those conversations, I said to him, I said, you know, let me tell you something I'm not good at, or at least I don't enjoy enough to be good at it. And that's closing, raising money specifically. I said, I know that's important. That's an important part of this job, running for office or being at a university. I said, now, I think we can raise a lot of money, but uh, what I think I can do is paint a picture for people of how this place will be better in, you know, in a big way. Something that folks I hope can get excited about. And, uh, and I think that'll attract people who want to support, let's say, the campaign or, or the university. But I said, I'm going to need some sidekicks to go in and kind of clean up after me and, you know, close the deals and sign the papers and all that sort of thing. I said, because I, that I don't enjoy. I'm not going to sit around on the phone doing it all day long. So both groups thought that could work. And yeah, we broke records both places. But I think you see what I'm getting at. I think the, 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 the essential element is not being able to shake people down for an extra 10% or 20 that they weren't going to give. It's trying to, again, to create an environment where people are excited to jump in on their own. I call it the vision thing. You know, you've got to be an optimist, but you've got to be a pragmatic optimist. You know, you don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. As you said, you want to root it in something that you can deliver on. Now, I want to switch to something else on universities because academic freedom and free expression is under threat at American universities. This is another area where Purdue has been a leader. In today's politically charged environment, there's so much discussion about safe spaces and trigger words. How are you able to chart a course that is different from many other 
prestigious universities. Well, it is a, it's an even bigger uh, issue, I think, than some people appreciate, Hank. I think it, uh, most people can uh, certainly see that having people shouted down and disinvited and only one point of view is permitted, that that uh, really violates uh, everything about our, the essence really of our free society. There's a reason free speech is the first part of the First Amendment. Now, there's something even bigger, I think, about it, which is that the advance of knowledge is impeded by this. Knowledge, whether it's scientific or social sciences, economics, always moves forward through the collision of ideas. A lot of the most brilliant insights in any field started as heresies. And so conformity of thought is not just an infringement of personal liberties and, and the free debate that makes a free society work. That's a huge problem all by itself, but it also gets in the way of the core responsibility of universities, which is to lead the progress of human understanding in all realms. So. With that said, when I got to our university, there's an organization, a watchdog group, and they rate schools based on their commitment to free exchange and free inquiry. And uh, we weren't bad, but we, they had us as a yellow light or, or something. And I went and looked to see what that was about. And it was a couple of smaller policies. You could only demonstrate at certain places on the campus. There were some restrictions on what you can put on a billboard, uh, stuff like that. So I said, let's fix all that because I want us to be seen as very clear, green light on, on these things. And then credit to the University of Chicago, which has been a leader in this area and a faculty led group up there, I, I saw produced a set of principles for their university that basically said, we're gonna protect unpopular ideas, the ability to express them and so forth. And very importantly, that uh, initiative was led by a self-avowed, very liberal uh, scholar, a longtime constitutional uh, leader in the constitutional law field. And um, it was not some, you know, uh, incensed uh, renegade conservative. And so I said to our board, you know, look at this set of principles. I said, now this is an academic institution. If we set out to write our own free speech principles, you know, it'll take whatever group, whatever committee is a uh, appointed, you know, three years, and it won't be as good as this one. So you're the board, you have the authority and the fiduciary duty, you can do anything you want here. Why don't we just endorse these principles verbatim? And besides which, they'll have more effect. If we can get a lot of schools not to write their own that are similar, but endorsing the same one, Hank, you'll remember the Sullivan principles against apartheid. Yep. That many, many companies subscribe to, Lily did, and they had more power because we all signed the same thing. Yep. As opposed to a hundred flavors of, you know, that looked a little bit alike. And that's what I had in mind. So we started a little campaign. We were the second school to do it. Then came others and we've got people calling them the Chicago principles. And I hope it's having a little bit of a positive effect. Now, I won't say this is still not easy. And there are still people, even at a campus like Purdue. See, I'm a little luckier than some. Two thirds of our students are studying a STEM discipline, which means two thirds of our faculty are teaching in engineering and science and in, and in areas where objective facts matter and where their area of emphasis is a little different than some whose passion and commitment is all around questions that are, I'll call them more political. But uh, still, we have these disagreements and uh, I don't think we have sufficient uh, diversity of viewpoint on our campus, either in terms of guests who come to see us or, or invited, or even uh, speech that's generated internally. But I think we at least are protecting rights in a way that's important and a way that I hope is beginning to get some traction across the rest of higher ed. Yeah, I sure hope so too. So I wanna turn now to the pandemic. You know, earlier this year, you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, which really caught my eye because you explained why universities had to shut down when it first came out, the COVID-19, and people didn't really understand it. But based upon what we knew at the time you wrote the op-ed, you believed it was your duty to reopen Purdue in the fall. So talk about your approach to reopening, the precautions you're taking against COVID-19, and what you're, what you're finding out. I think we're taping this with uh, four days to go before we break for Thanksgiving at Purdue University. One of the changes we made was to say that would be the last day of class. Tests will be administered remotely, which we now know how to do. 
like so many other things, we've all gotten better at doing things uh, uh, online and in other remote fashions. So it appears to those of us who have met literally every morning since uh, April or May on this problem that we are going to make it to the line and we will have had a campus that has been relatively open, 45,000 students. A majority of courses have been taught in person, at least in part. We've had thousands of opportunities for student interaction, not nearly what the campus would ordinarily look like, but on a spectrum of openness, uh, you know, Purdue will be toward the open end of, of that. And, you know, that op-ed you referenced, I wrote only at the specific request of the post. And it's the last one I've written. I'd been a contributing columnist there for a few years. And I thought it was best just to say nothing from then till at least now and see if, how this all worked out. And um, what the op-ed said was, based on the available evidence, and if higher ed doesn't pay close attention and show respect for science and evidence, then who should, who would? Based on the evidence, even then, two things were clear. One was that this virus, as dangerous as it is in certain subpopulations, older and particularly uh, frail older people, people with certain comorbidities, it was clear even then that it's very benign in young people and that our population, including our surrounding areas around campus, is over 80% under the age of 30 or 35. We're a very different population than, uh, let's say, a big city or uh, obviously a, a nursing home. And the second thing that was clear was our students really wanted to continue their education uninterrupted and they wanted to do it in an on-campus setting. You know, take the lab experience. Every, almost every Purdue student has, a, has courses that involve laboratory work and research work. And uh, we're just beginning to find ways to do some of that remotely. So anyway, uh, we said we thought it was our duty to try and we couldn't be sure that we could manage and control the virus but that uh, we were going to start then. People have now looked back and said, well, you made it when so many others didn't. How? And I say that the three reasons we made it, that we appear to have made it, first of all, an early start, because you and I have been talking about some major management and uh, implementation challenges in the various spheres of life. This is one of the biggest ones I had seen. We were trying to make a very dense community of 50-some thousand people students, staff, faculty, secure against this virus. And I knew we were going to need every day to get ready. And schools that procrastinated, I think, did so at their, to their eventual regret. The second thing was we threw the kitchen sink at it. We've spent tens of millions of dollars. We now see that many of those dollars were probably made no medical difference whatsoever, but we didn't know. We didn't know that, uh, you know, plexiglass in front of every faculty member and every staff member probably didn't help much. We didn't know that surfaces and keeping them disinfected rigorously probably, you know, it wasn't clear whether that was a big factor or a small factor in transmission. But I feel good about that because I said many of those millions maybe didn't stop a single case, but if they brought people peace of mind and the sense that they were in a safer environment, then that has value too. And then the third and indispensable thing was, and this was really important to me, our students really stepped up. The sine qua non of all this was student compliance. And I've got a thick file. I'm going to try to suppress the uh, instinct to write these people back now who said it's delusional. Kids will be kids. They're, they're going to be super spreaders. They're going to be you know, partying every night. And you're just taking a reckless, murderous uh, chance bringing them back to campus. And I thought, no. I've spent a lot of time in any job I've had. I bet you were the same way, Hank. I always try to get out of the office and, you know, get out where the product's being made or sold or among your employee, employers if you're an elected official. I, I spent a lot of time around our students. They come in every description. Uh, and we got a few knuckleheads. But overwhelmingly, they want to do good things. They want to be part of a, a safer, a, a cleaner planet. They want to, uh, you know, do things for people who are disadvantaged or who are ill. And I was really convinced all along that we could rally them and you should see our campus. They all signed a pledge to do all the important things, social distance, check your symptoms, stay in if you're sick or if you feel badly and masking. For instance, the masking pledge just says, always when indoors and outdoors if you're in some kind of a congested situation. One of our students just on his own 
a couple weeks ago, sat outside a busy walkway and just made a little study of how many students were wearing masks outside, which is going beyond the pledge, 94%, which has been the case all year. So anybody who's troubled about the younger generation can take some heart from our experience because 45,000 young people have played an incredibly essential role in an, allowing us to operate and enabling themselves to continue a first-class residential education, even in this mess. I tell you, that's really inspiring. Now, Mitch, I'm going to move to another area where you and I have spent a bunch of time together. Purdue does important research and the U.S. government is rightly concerned about the need to protect our intellectual property and innovation, particularly with regard to Chinese scholars and researchers. We both share the view that this should be a priority, but it should be done in a way that doesn't disadvantage our major research institutions, which are so vital to our economic and national security. So a few words about how you're striking this balance at Purdue. This is such an important and tough subject, Hank, and no one has led us in the country has led better on this than you have with your knowledge about China and your credibility on this issue. But it's a tough one. I mean, and we're, we're ground zero in a way. Uh, Purdue has, uh, although we've uh, scaled it back over recent years, and that started before the uh, controversies of the recent administration, but uh, still, uh, we have a very substantial percentage of international and their and Chinese students and scholars on our campus. And they are concentrated in areas where we do important research, including some bearing on national security directly. But I wanna make this point. We have won the, there's an award given by the Defense Security Agency for the most secure and I'll say security conscious campus in America. And we've won it two years back to back. So at least they believe, and I believe they're right, that we are having the advantage of the brilliance, in some cases, irreplaceable or hard to replace brilliance of a Chinese, a postdocs and some faculty members without taking risks with vital either national security or let's say industrial espionage type uh, activities. Now, you can't prove a negative. I, Maybe someone was so clever that they did something that no one has discovered yet, but we've placed a lot of emphasis on procedures and practices that we believe keep uh, reasonable protections, necessary protections around the most sensitive work. But, uh, you know, it's an everyday challenge. I just last week got my semi-annual briefing from the woman who runs our security operations. I we try to make that a high priority. I told her she has walk-in privileges. Anytime she sees a problem, don't wait for an appointment. Just come, you know, throw the door open. And I meet with her regularly just to try to make certain that we're doing it all right. We have a very tight relationship, same uh, relationship with our local FBI office. And I see them fairly often. And they also know they've got my cell phone number. We won't let one second go by. If somebody spots a potential problem, we'll investigate it right away. And uh, that's so important because, as you know, the concern I have is we, we have to protect our national security, but we don't want to go to the extreme here that we end up weakening our universities and, you know, the innovation in America is one of our big strengths. And so I want to get to a related topic. U.S. immigration policies, how are they impacting Purdue? And more broadly, how are they impacting our country's ability to innovate? The immediate effect for Purdue is that uh, we've got students who uh, are in their home countries and can't come here for, that's mainly travel restrictions right now and COVID related. So that's the single biggest issue we have right now. And we're hoping that many of them will now be able to get visas to, uh, to come or to come back to campus. The longer term question that you're raising is of course of, of importance to a school like ours. We're now we were once as high as third, as I recall, second or third in terms of the absolute number of international students on any American campus. Most recent tabulation I saw had us ninth. So internationals are still nine or ten percent of our of our undergraduate population, and uh, a much higher percentage of our graduate students. You know, obviously, we believe that it's a great thing for the country. Who can doubt to welcome? 
the kind of talent that still wants to come here. And most often they start in one of our universities and then uh, stay here. Everybody knows about you know, Silicon Valley being full of people who emigrated and then started great companies and so forth. 16% of our international students take their first job in Indiana. And I always say to our friends here, we're a brain gain. People worry about brain drains. I said, we're a brain gain machine. And so I very much favor, and I always have, being very uh, welcoming to immigrants in this country. Now, uh, it's not the question you ask. I, I think we could make a lot of changes and maybe changes that would make people who are concerned about the problems that can come more comfortable. And I still, I hope maybe that can be some, a subject the nation returns to soon in a way that, in a package maybe, that does include the opportunity or the continued opportunity for people to study and for people of, of great talent and brilliance and or resources to come here and become great Americans. Yep. You know, we need to continue to be a magnet for talent like we have for so many years. So one last question here. What advice are you giving students about how to navigate their lives and careers coming out of this pandemic? This has been quite an experience for young people living through this and looking for a job. I've said things like, look at the, at the bright side. You're living through something that historians, sociologists, economists, psychologists, and others are going to be studying for a long time. This is going to be a research bonanza as a source of research across almost every discipline we teach here, Hank. Uh, and as awful and or difficult a situation as it's been now, I've, I've tried to point out to our students that you know their children will ask them, what was that like, Bill? Because they'll know about this. You know, one of the big uh, iconic uh, structures on our campus, somebody noticed is this was reaching its 25th anniversary. It's a big uh, tower that has Carillon of Bells in it. And I said, you know, why don't we put a time capsule in that? Why don't we have a little ceremony and put a time capsule in there? And so we did. And students wrote the, uh, some messages about what it's like to be a student at Purdue in 2020. You know, yeah. we put in the kit uh, of a thermometer and a mask and every, all these things that we gave every student coming in. And uh, whoever, uh, I hope there'll be a university or something that looks like one there in 75 years. But I've talked to him about that. I've talked to him about the opportunities that this is opening up. It's, as it's accelerated a lot of trends, think of the new businesses that are already appearing that uh, take advantage of not just the technology that we're using right now, but the changes in people's behavior and habits and preferences for how they lead their lives. You know, we call ourselves Entrepreneur U at Purdue. We have more startup companies year in and year out than almost any school anywhere. And we got kids working right now on things that, uh, you know, maybe you and I will be using that we haven't even, in a couple of years, we haven't conceived of yet. So I try to get them to see the opportunity that's in it. And, uh, you know, beyond that, I just commend them for, we talk about grit a lot at Purdue. I've given speeches about this very worrisome thing that uh, there's this huge run up in loneliness and uh, sort of fragility. Yeah. Um, I gave a speech a couple of years ago talking about how that we need to build a, along with great uh, academic and um, uh, intellectual strength. We need to build a fortitude to deal with the inevitable setbacks of life. And I told our students, I'll tell you how to live a stress-free life. Just don't do anything consequential. Don't take on any challenges. Don't you know, take on any injustices. Don't take on any jobs with big responsibility. But I said, that's not what we imagine for you. And so I try to get them to see that this thing we're going through right now uh, can be seen as they conquer it in the way they are as, a, as an important growth opportunity and something they can be proud of later on, even though it's a big pain in the neck right now. You know, Mitch, I could not agree with you anymore. You know, it's one of the things that's made our country great over the years is grit, resilience, determination. And I don't want to see us getting soft. You know, as I go to places like China and I look at the work ethic and the grit, you know, it, it's powerful. And uh, we've always had that. I've said to my grandchildren often that the only real happiness and satisfaction really comes from doing something that's difficult, encountering adversity. Right. You know, if it's easy, there's not much good that comes out of that. There's no real satisfaction. So it's, 
I just really love that you know you're working to instill that in the Purdue culture. Well, we we'd like to think it's already it's always been there. That's why we call ourselves Boilermakers. But uh, you know, it, it's really important right now. I in a speech a couple of years before we ever heard of COVID, I was talking a uh, commencement speech. I was talking to the graduates about this. And I said, you know, I'm, I want to call up the, 